When you think of Star Wars The Phantom Menace, you want to think about this. And this. Sadly, it is often remembered for this. I need a midichlorian count. This. And this. Yippee! But did you know that this was not always meant to be? The original draft for episode 1 was quite different, and in many ways was better than the movie we would end up getting. My name is Captain Robau, and this is the story of Star Wars Episode 1, The Beginning. George Lucas began writing Episode 1 in 1994. Unlike the second and third prequel movies, Episode 1 began on paper, with ideas explored through writing, and the art department was only involved much later. Also, the story behind the prequels hadn't yet solidified, so there was more freedom to take the story in any direction. Thus, these early drafts of the beginning contain elements that are wildly different from what we would get in The Phantom Menace. While we have no actual first-hand copies of the beginning's early script, we have a detailed summary of the revised rough draft. This comes courtesy of the 1999 CD-ROM The Episode 1 Insider's Guide. One of its features was a copy of the final script, with annotations about how the rough draft differed. The basic premise of the beginning is the same as that of The Phantom Menace. The Trade Federation is blockading a small planet with their fleet of deadly battleships. The details are a bit different though, as the Trade Federation is called the Federation of Galactic Traders, and the planet is called Utapau instead of Naboo. In this script, Naboo is only the name of Queen Amidala's people. The first big difference is that it is only Obi-Wan who is sent to investigate the trade dispute. Qui-Gon doesn't appear until much later. Obi-Wan's characterization was essentially what became Qui-Gon in the final film having many of the same lines and mannerisms. This Obi-Wan is about 30 years old and wears all black. Like the final movie, the Republic cruiser is destroyed, and Obi-Wan has to fight the Droidicus before stowing away on one of the landing craft headed for the planet. On the surface, Obi-Wan rescues Jar Jar Binks from the advanced trader army. The design for the Gungans hadn't been finalized at this point yet, so there are still quite a few different concepts being explored. While Jar Jar is still a very childlike and emotional character, he speaks normally and is in general not so over the top as in the final version. Boss Nas is known as Governor Nas and he speaks normally, just like Jar Jar. Nas agrees to help Obi-Wan contact the Naboo via the Gungan comlink. He pushes a button and the entire dome becomes a screen filled with static. All outside communications must have been disrupted by the traitor army. Like the Phantom Menace, Obi-Wan and Jar Jar must travel through the core of the planet to reach the Naboo capital. Obi-Wan reaches this city just before the traitor's army does. He and Jar Jar are met by a curious crowd and a group of Naboo guards escort Obi-Wan and Jar Jar to the palace. A guard tells Jar Jar he must wait outside. Inside, Kenobi convinces Queen Amidala to flee before the invasion begins. There is more racial tension between the Gungans and the Naboo in this script than in the final movie. Amidala tries to prevent Jar Jar from entering her ship. Obi-Wan argues and wins the point, but Amidala insists that the Gungan be kept in the droid hold. The Queen's starship is not in a hangar, but instead is hidden beneath a large fountain and rises from the water when needed. When they arrive at Tatooine, Obi-Wan, dressed as a moisture farmer, leads the group into Mos Espa. Padme is shown to be well trained in self-defense. Upon entering Mos Espa, she is grabbed by a creature. She hits the creature, causing it to double over in pain. This attracts the attention of local merchants and they clear the way for the entourage. The Anakin they meet here is older, around 12 years old, making the age gap between him and the 14 year old Padme a little more believable. When Anakin introduces C-3PO to Padme and R2, he says that he built the droid from rejected parts and that he lacks both a voice and coverings. 3PO doesn't talk at all in this version of the movie. The midichlorians hadn't yet made it into the film story at this stage. This concept would not be introduced until the second screenplay draft, around 1995. Pod race, however, is mostly the same. The biggest change is that there is no two-headed pod race announcer. Instead, it is Jabba himself who makes the introductions and commands the race to begin in Hatiz. After Anakin wins the pod race and his freedom, the group tried to leave Tatooine. Here they encountered Darth Maul. Darth Maul's appearance evolved many times in these early stages. The Sith is also far more vocal throughout the movie, having many more lines than in the final screenplay. Obi-Wan and Darth Maul are the ones to duel, and they exhibit much more Jedi powers than do Qui-Gon and Maul in the final film. The two combatants are shown levitating objects, moving extremely fast and vibrating to the point of becoming almost invisible. 
they also leap over one another in an incredible display of acrobatics. Obi-Wan leaps onto the ship's ramp for escape, much like Qui-Gon in the final film. With her hyperdrive fixed, our heroes travel to Coruscant. It is here where we first meet Qui-Gon Jinn on a landing platform, standing alongside Palpatine and Valorum. Anakin is taken in front of the Jedi Council, which consists only of a mace, Yoda and Ki Adi Mundi. The Senate proceedings contain a few more elements in the beginning than in the final film. Cutting these extra lines about political motions and vote results might have been one of the few good calls made when George Lucas morphed this script into The Phantom Menace. Upon returning to Utapau, the entire traitor's blockade is found still in place. In order to avoid the battleships, Obi-Wan proposes a plan that relies on the Force skills of Anakin. Obi-Wan believes that Anakin's innate connection to the Force will enable him to sense the proper moment to come out of light speed. Anakin closes his eyes and does so. The starship exits light speed just above the surface of the planet and the amazed captain flies the ship into Utapau's atmosphere. The Queen's ship heads straight into a Naboo lake and after a short trip settles into one of the large glowing bubbles of Otogunga. No meeting takes place in the Gungan sacred place, instead the heroes plot the battle against the droid army in a Gungan war room. Similar to the final film, the plot splits up the various characters during the final act. Jar Jar heads off with the Gungan army, but instead of the bumbling fool, he's an intentional hero during the battle. He leads his troops with courage and displays quick thinking. At one point, Binks finds himself face to face with the destroyer droid. Jar Jar reaches for his pistol, but the weapon is knocked from his hands before he can fire it. The Gungan resorts to grabbing a handful of mud and throwing it at the droid's single eye. While the destroyer is blinded, Binks makes his escape. Anakin and R2 head off on a subquest that's all about the reprogramming of the backup droid controls. Along the way, Anakin creates a diversion by having R2 fire a flare into a fuel tank. R2 falls into a junk heap to avoid detection and Anakin knocks over a few battle droids by knocking one down and creating a domino effect as they bump into each other and fall over. When they finally meet up with the Jedi Knights and Padme in the hangar, the latter joins them in a two-person starfighter and they go up to take out the traitor's command ship. Darth Maul shows up to challenge Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. He doesn't have a dual bladed lightsaber though. The duel that takes place in the shield generator complex has a near identical locale as the film, catwalks and all. However, this installation does not have the laser gates, which become vital late in the duel in the film version. Qui-Gon confronts Darth Maul alone when Obi-Wan is pushed off a gantry. As Kenobi hurries to rejoin the fight, the energetic Maul quickly wears down Obi-Wan's mentor. Eventually, Qui-Gon slips and is cut down. Obi-Wan and Maul then clash in the complex. Their style of fighting is old, but I understand it now. You learn fast. You don't bother to learn. I don't have to. Before Maul can act, Kenobi lashes out and cuts the Sith warrior in half. He studies his fallen enemy and says, Learn not, live not, my master always says. Up in space, Anakin and Padme spot the heavily armed command ship and with the help of other Naboo starfighters disable the deflector shield and destroy the control tower. With the primary command ship disabled, Gunray immediately orders his followers to activate the backup droid command ship. Moments after he gives the order, Panaka and his troops surround the Viceroy. Because Anakin had previously replaced all the battle droid commands, the traitor's troops begin running in circles, bumping into walls and falling over. Utapau is saved, the Gungans and the Naboo celebrate and our heroes mourn the death of Qui-Gon. And that's what Star Wars The Beginning would have been like. In late summer of 1995, George Lucas wrote a second draft, in which Obi-Wan Kenobi's role was taken by the character of Qui-Gon Jinn. Kenobi still appeared in the script, but as Qui-Gon's student. After many more changes, Lucas scrapped this draft and by 1997, the final script of The Phantom Menace had replaced it. So what is this draft's legacy? The name Utapau would later be used as the name for the rocky planet of Utapau, featured in Attack of the Clones. The beginning's biggest legacy, however, is that it didn't have much of a legacy at all. Many of the changes seem to have been to the detriment of the eventual Star Wars Episode 1 that we would get, making Jar Jar a bumbling idiot, introducing midichlorians, turning Anakin into a young child, giving less dialogue to Darth Maul, etc. What do you think? Would this episode of Episode 1 have been a better movie than The Phantom Menace? Let me know in the comments down below. I am Captain Robo and that was the story of Star Wars The Beginning, the undeveloped first draft of The Phantom Menace. If you found this video interesting and want to see more, please give it a like. 
If you want to explore more undeveloped movie concepts like this one, click one of the videos on screen.